if you'll just now lean back and relax, we shall begin our journey to the place called Megiddo. We've left from Jerusalem aboard these buses. You'll notice that they have air conditioners upon them. With the air conditioners running full blast inside the bus, it was a comfortable 91 degrees. <laughs> 91 degrees. And this, by the way, happened to be in July. But when we stepped out the door, it was like stepping into a blast furnace. It was 122 degrees. But you know what they said to us? They said, you'll hardly notice it's a dry heat. You ever heard that before? Yeah, you've heard that before. Well, I noticed. There's much to see, and so let's get about it, shall we? We're going to pause briefly at the signboard that greets us here. And it says Megiddo. And I'm going to talk to you now for just a moment or two about the name Armageddon. It's mentioned only once in the Bible, and that's from our favorite book, The Revelation, and the 16th chapter, beginning down to about verse 15. Armageddon, the Old Testament word, is made by joining together two Hebrew or Old Testament words. The first of those words is har, H-A-R. That's the way we would say it and write it, H-A-R. The word har in the Old Testament language means the hilltop or the high place. The second word is megadon. Megadon carries the idea of the gathering, the, the place of assembly. You put the two together, har, megadon, and transliterate, kind of say it quickly, and you come up with the idea of the hilltop of the assembly or the high place of the gathering. Armageddon. Now, the sign at the top just mentions Megiddo. And this, by the way, for your interest's sake, is in the plain of Esdralon. Some of you are going to go home and look in your maps, your Bible maps. And beneath the name Megiddo, it gives us a scripture from the Old Testament book of Judges. It says, Then fought the kings of Canaan by the waters of Tanak in the valley of Megiddo. The sign goes on to tell us that this place has been fought over bitterly contested and fought over and battled in and around for 5,000 years. It's been fought over by the Phoenicians. It's been fought over by the Canaanites and by the Hicksus. It's been fought over by the British under General Allenby in modern times. It's a place of one continuous battle. And then the sign concludes with the scripture from the Revelation that we alluded to just a bit ago in chapter 16. He then gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew language Armageddon. There's much here to see in terms of geography and topography, and so let's begin to have a look around, shall we? We've turned around from the signboard 180 degrees, and we're looking at a range of mountains. Now, if we could see through that cut, if there was an opening there, or if we were up on top of that mountain and looking to the west, we would be looking at the blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea, not too far from Haifa or Caesarea. If you look for it on your Bible map, <clears throat> you'll see some folks standing up there right on the edge of the cliff. They are. These mountains are a part of the Carmel Range. And every time of, uh, that I think of Mount Carmel, I'm reminded of the time that the old prophet Elijah had that standoff with the false prophets of Baal, you remember? They said, our gods are the true gods, our gods plural, and Elijah said, no, my God, singular, is the true God. And the debate then ended in a little bit of a contest. Elijah said, we'll each build an altar, and then we'll put upon our altar an offering, a sacrifice. And the God or gods, in your case, that answer by consuming the sacrifice, the offering with fire, is the true God or gods. And so they built their little altars of stone. And then Elijah said, I shall be a gentleman, you go first. And they began to pray after placing their offering atop their altar, and nothing happened. And they prayed more and longer, and nothing happened. And after several minutes of their prayer, Elijah began to tease them and tempt them a little bit. He said, uh, could it be that your gods are all asleep and they can't hear you? <laughs> and they began to scream and shout more loudly. And then Elijah said, well, is it possible that your gods are all out of town? <laughs> Maybe they're on a, a long vacation. They're out of town. And by now, these false prophets were doing some really crazy things, cutting themselves and, and other really ugly things. And so Elijah stopped it. He said, you've had your turn and your chance. Now it's mine. But before I pray... 
I want you to dig a ditch around my altar. And they did that. Now he said, bring gallons and gallons of water and fill that ditch. And they did that. And then he began to pray. At mid-sentence his prayer, fire flashed down from God and not only consumed the offering, but then burned the stones as if they were coal and lapped up the water like it had been gasoline. And all of that happened right up on top of that mountain where we should have been. <laughs> all right? Now, I'm probably going to do that again because this is a new machine here, and, um, and I'm an old man. How's that for you? Huh? That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Now, we've turned around 180 degrees again, and we're, look, we're having our first glimpse of the ruins of Megiddo. Now, Megiddo, ladies and gentlemen, is a tell, and you may spell that one of two ways and be correct, T-E-L or T-E-L-L. -L. Either way we spell it, it simply means a mound of ruins that are unrelated to the natural geography and topography. In other words... This hill is the result of people building a city and then an enemy coming and knocking it down and that enemy building atop those ruins and then an enemy coming and knocking theirs down and building atop their ruins until it gets higher and higher and higher still. You might be interested to note that there are 20 different elevations here, 20 different uh, empires or, or peoples who built and lived here. And... In the year 1962, 63, the years 62, 63, an archaeologist by the name of Dr. Yagel Yadin began an archaeological dig here that lasted, as I mentioned, for about two years. And he discovered at the ninth level the Egyptian civilization. Now I'm going to try to use the pointer here and, and show you about where that would be. If there are 20 levels, the ninth perhaps would be somewhere right around in there. And that was at the time of the Egyptians, King Tutmos III. King Tutmos III was here 1,500 years before the birth of Jesus. Now that tells us then that long before the birth of Jesus, this was an old, old battleground. Now, we're going to go inside the museum and spend a few moments, and then we shall walk outside and climb to the top of that mountain and see there the ancient ruins that date back hundred, yes, thousands of years now. Here's an artist's mock-up of what the top of this fort looked like at the time of Kings David and Solomon, which would take us back a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. King David kept in a perimeter around the city of Jerusalem these cities that would not permit an enemy to sneak up on the capital city, Jerusalem. And this happened to be one of them. He kept here 500 soldiers and at least 150 horses and some chariots of war and all of that sort of thing. Now, you're going to notice over here on the right-hand side of the screen a road. There it is. We're going to walk up that same road in reality in just a few moments. This road would go up at an angle of about 18 degrees, and then when it neared the top, you went through an arch. When you got into that first uh, alcove, that first archway, then you had to take a hard left-hand turn to go and gain entrance inside the fort. And all the way around, there were the defenders with their weapons of war trying to prevent any such thing from happening. Now, with that, we're ready to look again. There's the top of the road, and we'll be walking up that in just a little bit. During the time of the archaeological dig, large amounts of gems, jewels, coins, carved ivory were discovered, which proved then that whomever was in charge of this piece of real estate would become very, very wealthy. Now I'm going to tell you what this is and then why it's been fought over and how folks became wealthy. This is a coin, but it's more than that. It is a signet ring. King Jeroboam of Israel had a servant. Actually, he was more like a vice president, and his name was Shema. When King Jeroboam would make a statement, when he would make a proclamation, Shema would write it down on a parchment or some such thing and then fold that, drip hot wax onto the fold and then press this ring into the hot wax. And as soon as the ring was pressed into the wax, this became binding. It became law. This was the king's signature, if you please. The seal 
of Shema. And you'll notice on there, by the way, what animal? A lion. Do you remember what Revelation chapter 5, verse 5 says about Jesus? He is the lion of which tribe? Exactly so. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The seal of Shema. Now, what about the carved gems and jewels and the ivory and, and that sort of thing? This place, ladies and gentlemen, for a long time before the time of Jesus and for a good while after, was a crossroad of the world. In other words, if a camel caravan was coming from the south out of Egypt, out of the Cairo area, and going north up into the area of Syria, Damascus, or, or maybe turning then a little bit to the left, to the west, and going into the area of Beirut, Lebanon, it would go right through here. If on the other hand, a ship had offloaded treasures onto a camel caravan over around Haifa or Caesarea, and these treasures were headed for the capital city of the world uh, for uh, some six, seven hundred years, and that being what we're going to talk about tonight, out uh, the, the headquarter of the world, the place called Iraq today, that camel caravan loaded with all those treasures would go right through here. That means then that whomever was in charge of this fort and its armies could stop the camel caravans and tell them, you're going to pay this much more before you take another step. And the folks would either pay up or turn back. And so that's why oft times the place was fought over during those hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, during the excavations, they discovered these stones that put together made an altar. This altar is unique in that it has four horns on the four corners. That tells us that this place was not only a place of defense, but was also, at one time at least, a city of refuge. A city of refuge was for this purpose. If a man was to take another man's life by accident, not, not by premeditation, but by accident, if the perpetrator could leave the scene of the accident and get to one of the cities of refuge and touch one of the horns of the altar, then that man's life would be spared and the members of the deceased family could not harm him. It was not so much unlike playing hide and seek. And when you touch home base, then you're free. The city of refuge. Now we've stepped outside the museum and we're greeted by a sign that speaks to us in three separate languages, all giving the same warning. There are dangerous places here. Please watch your children. And so I'm going to encourage all of you parents to have a good hand on the kids from this point on. All right? Now we're walking up that very same road that was here at the time of David and Solomon and continues to be here. It may have been here for hundreds of years prior. That I'm not sure of. We're following a guide who is a professor of antiquities at the Jerusalem University. And he knew these folks like they'd been his next door neighbors. I mean, the folks who lived here and conquered here hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. We would climb a ways and then stop in our climbing. We old fat folks would catch our breath. And, uh, and Jacob would describe to us, look at the small round stones, he might say. Those are from the Hyksos era. And then he might point out to the larger uh, uh, rectangular stones and say to us, this is from the Egyptian era. And then when we got near the top, he said to us, these, the large stones, are from the time of Kings David and Solomon. There he is. His name is Jacob. And what you folks can't see, I'm going to tell you. Right behind that arm that hangs at his side, there is a holstered 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol. And now I remind you once more, this man is a doctor. He's a professor at the univer Hebrew University, but he has that pistol at his side every day and every hour of every day and at his bedside every night. For you see, ladies and gentlemen, Israel is an armed camp. And nearly every person that is uh, able, every person that has fair health, has such a military-issued armament. Uh, in some cases, it's the Uzi, the, with the best machine gun they say in all the world today. Uh, and so he would get on our tour bus every morning and give this little speech. It was like this. If the sirens go off today, I shall have to leave you wherever we are. Now, you probably will remember that back during the first Gulf War of 90, 
the sirens would go off because the Scud missiles were coming in and around Jerusalem. You remember that now, don't you? All right? The whole of the nation of Israel is intersected and uh, intertwined with these sirens. And they go off simultaneously to give a warning that there is an attack, a military attack. And that's the only time they go off. Not unlike over in Kansas where they have sirens that warn of the tornadoes and that sort of thing. And so <clears throat> Jacob would say to us every morning as we aborted the bus, if the sirens go off, I shall have to leave you. And then he would go on to explain, if there is a military conveyance, if there is a jeep or something nearby, I shall go with them. But he said, if there is no such military conveyance and there happens by a tourist with an automobile or, or someone who lives here, I will take my gun and demand they get out and I will take their vehicle. And he said, in case there is not one of those, I will make you folks get off of the bus and I will take this bus. And I'll be out on the battlefield in a few minutes. Now, folks, that isn't the most encouraging way to start your day. I can tell you this much, that when you begin your day with a warning like that, you don't need any coffee to wake up. Yes, sir. And so that's a little bit about the background of Jacob. Our Lord Jesus said, when you see this area surrounded by armies, know the end is near. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the dangers of this area during our lecture. Now we're at the top of the hill where you had to make that really hard left-hand turn before you could gain the summit, and we've done that now. I want you over near the center of the picture to notice those pillars that stand. Those are the remains of the horse barn, the stanchions for the war horses. That's where they were kept, and nearby we're going to see the feeding trough carved out of the native stone here, and that would be filled with grain, and there the horses were eat, would eat. Now, where would they get the grain? Well, we're going now to the granary. It's a hole in the ground about 30 feet in diameter and 20 feet deep, and it was filled with grain, and it has this serpentine ladder. It goes all the way around, you see, and it winds around until you come up at the, the ground level up above. And whomever was in charge of KP would come here with buckets and fill them up and take them over, feed the horses, and then take it over to the mess hall and... Um, and make grits, I suppose. You folks like grits? Oh, I've spent enough time in the South. I've come to love grits. Yeah. All right. So we wonder then, who are the neighbors and, and, and what's all around here? We have walked to the extreme south end of these ruins, and we're looking to the south and then just a touch to the east. And as we do that, we're looking over into King Hussein's Jordan. Now, on the other side is a rock. And during the Gulf Wars, the Scud missiles came from a rock and over in that area and crossed Jordan, King Hussein's Jordan. And it's been a very tough situation for the Hussein family because they've always been friendly to the West, very friendly to the United States. And uh, Queen Noor, who uh, still lives out in uh, Mon Jordan, the capital city, though her son by adoption is now the king because her husband died, you remember, of cancer a few years ago? All right. She was an American girl. She was born and raised in New York City. And so they've always been friendly toward the West. And that's put them in a really unfriendly situation with many of their Arab neighbors. And so now we turn away and walk in the opposite direction. We walk to the north. And when we look due north now, we're looking into the Bekaa Valley of Syria. And some of you remember when a few years Terry Anderson and Terry Waite were held prisoner and captive up there. All right. It was right up there in the Bekaa Valley. And then if we turn and look a little bit over toward the left, a little bit further to the west now, we'd be looking into the area of Beirut, Lebanon, and hardly a day goes by, ladies and gentlemen, except there's a skirmish between the Israeli army and the Hezbollah or some such other group there in southern Lebanon. And it's such a tragedy, but I'm afraid it's going to continue until Jesus comes. All right? We noted they had a great granary where they could hold a year's supply of food, but what about water? It's a fair ways to the nearest source, which is the Jordan River. You couldn't just at leisure open the gates and go out, for your enemy is outside waiting just that event. A thousand years before the birth of Jesus, during the time of the reign of King Ahab, they began to dig a shaft at an angle of about 35 degrees. They dug down and down and down, and down at about 180, 200 feet, they hit an underground river. 
I've often wondered how they found it. Maybe God gave someone a vision, or maybe there was someone that used one of those willow switches like an old neighbor of ours in Idaho once used. Yeah, a water diviner, some such thing as that. I don't know. I do know, however, it's fascinating, and we want to go down in there. Sign says that it's going to mean that we go down 183 steps, and then when we climb back up, We'll go through another exit, through another shaft, and we'll be out where the buses are parked. We'll only have to climb back up uh, about 80 feet, and we old folks will appreciate that. Now, where the shaft goes underground, there is a concrete lid over the whole thing. We step down inside and walk down about 20 or 25 steps, and now the temperatures have changed from 120 plus degrees to about 68 degrees. I wanted to just stay there. <laughs> we paused and, and became quiet, and you could hear the water running, those long steps down beneath. And after a bit, we moved on down. We were able to lean over and drink out of that cold underground stream. Out there they call it a river. Here we'd call it a, a creek, but over in Idaho it would be a crick, of course. <laughs> I thought how smug. A soldier of David might feel he's down here dipping up gallons of fresh water and his enemies are walking right overhead just waiting for them to come out so they can get him. Most remarkable. We see the soldiers with their military weapons gathered all around this area and we're reminded once more of the warning of Jesus. When you see this happen, then know my coming is very near. I want to thank you for traveling with me tonight. I recently heard the story of the ice fisherman who upon the ice had erected his tent, made his little fire in a bucket, and drilled a hole and was putting through his line and hook and his worm. When he heard a voice, there are no fish there. And so he moved his tent and moved his fire, was drilling the second hole when he heard again a voice that said, there are no fish there. So he moved his tent again, moved his bucket, and began to drill the third hole when once more he heard a voice that fairly shouted, There are no fish there. And the fisherman looked up and asked, Are you God? And the voice came back, No, sir, I'm the manager of the ice skating rink. <laughs> God has chosen to speak other than audibly. I want you folks, if you will, please, to open your Bibles with me to our first scripture. It's in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to see how God has chosen to speak, and then we're going to enlarge upon that from night to night. I'm going to begin to read at the 19th verse, and then I shall read at verse 21 as well. I encourage you, by the way, to bring your Bibles each evening. If you don't have one, we'll give you one. I want you to have your Bibles. I want you to be able to read. I don't want anyone to go home and say, I heard Lyle say. I want you to be able to go home and say, I saw in my Bible. For one verse from this scripture is of greater value than anything I shall ever speak in a lifetime. And so we're ready to read then 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 and then 21. And this voice which came from heaven we heard... And we were with him in the holy mountain. We have therefore a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto we do well to take heed like a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. And then verse 21. For prophecy came not in days of old by the will of man, but rather holy men of God spake as... Now you help me. What does it conclude with? How does it finish there? They spake as they were moved by the... Holy Spirit of God. And so our Bibles then are a collection of God speaking to his prophets and they're writing it down and saving it for posterity. This is not a collection of sacred myth. This is indeed the word of God, a sure word of prophecy. With that for background, I want you and I to turn together to the last book in the Bible, the Revelation, to which we alluded during our travels together. And we're going to read one of the last chapters and some of the last verses in that last the 16th chapter revelation is the book for those who live in the very last days just before the last missionary goes over the last hill 
It's a book for you and for me. And so we're going to read together from chapter 16, beginning at the 13th verse. Here John in this vision says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. One came out of the mouth of the dragon. One came out of the mouth of the beast. And one came from the mouth of the false prophet. And then he goes on to say, for these are the spirits of, is this the Holy Spirit at work? No, these are demon spirits. These are the spirits of devils. They're working miracles. And they go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the great battle of God Almighty. And then he says in verse 15, Look, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that hears and keeps the words of this book, unless he be found naked and they see his shame. Then we come to our special verse for this evening. This, the 19th. I'm sorry, the 14th verse, 16th. Uh, I'll get there after a while. The 16th verse, and they, they gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon, Armageddon. Since I've been around church, folks, I've known that the last great battle was to be sparked in that place called Armageddon. But for a long, long while, I had no information about why and how and, and uh, what's behind it all. I just couldn't quite figure it out. I have a far better understanding tonight, and I'm going to try my best to share that understanding with you. Now tonight, we're going to be talking about the peoples of the Middle East in general. And I need to make a statement at the very outset. Lyle holds no prejudice toward any people of any race or any country on any portion of the planet on the face of God's earth. If I know my own heart, and I believe I do, I hold no malice, no prejudice to any race, to any people, to any faith, to any religion. I have been on record for the past 37 years as saying that I believe God has his children in all denominations. In all Christian faiths, I will go beyond that again tonight to say to you that I have always believed that God has his precious children in the faith of Islam and in the faith of Buddhism and Shintoism and Confucianism. God has his dear people in all religions and in all countries all around the world. And so I hold no animus toward any people, uh, toward no faith whatsoever. God has many, many wonderful children who are adherents to the belief of Islam. Now, I need to say this to you. I was first introduced to the peoples of Iran when a teenager, an older friend of mine, married a girl from Iran. She was beautiful beyond my description here tonight, and she was sweet, and so also was her family. And it was way back then that I learned that peoples with an Islamic background can be wonderful, lovely, sweet, kind, generous people. We're going to go beyond that tonight to discover that in all faiths, in all uh, religions, there are extremists. Maybe you've known one in your church. There happen to be a few around. There are extremists in all faiths. And that's what we're going to be alluding to when we talk together about the problem out in the Bible land tonight. And having, by the way, used that phrase, the Bible land, I want to enlarge our horizons and our minds' borders this evening. We think about the Holy Land, and our minds go to Palestine, to Jerusalem, and that's rightful, and that's good. But I want to enlarge your thinking tonight I want to just share with you a little bit of background information about the place that we call Iraq. And I think that we should really refer to it as well as the Bible lands. Are you ready? Here are some facts regarding Iraq. We believe that the Garden of Eden was placed in Iraq. Mesopotamia, which is now Iraq, we believe to be the cradle of civilization. We believe that it was in Iraq that Noah built his ark. We know that it was in Iraq that the Tower of Babel was built. Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldees, which is in southern Iraq. Isaac's wife, Rebekah, was born in Nahar, which is Iraq. Jacob made, met his wife, Rachel, in Iraq. Jonah preached in Nineveh, which is in Iraq. Assyria, which is in Iraq, was conquered by the ten tribes of Israel. Amos cried out in Iraq. Babylon, which is in Iraq, was destroyed, uh, rather went over and destroyed Jerusalem. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den in Iraq. The three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace were in Iraq. Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, saw the writing upon the wall. That was in Iraq. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried the Jews captive into Iraq. Ezekiel went and preached in Iraq. The wise men were from Iraq. Peter preached over in Iraq. 
The empire of man, as it's called in the Revelation, is also spiritually called Babylon, a city in a rock. <laughs> we could go on and on, but let that for now at least suffice. The Bible land, the Middle East, perhaps we need to enlarge our horizons. Now, I'm going to read to you a statement that I find more than troubling. Again, not to be unkind or to be judgmental, but to have our eyes open to what's going on around us. The present president of the nation of Iran recently said, and I'm quoting, my mission is to prepare the world for the end times by paving the way for the arrival of the prophet Imam Mahdi. Ladies and gentlemen, it's no news to you that since 9-11 of the year 01, the world has changed. And a lot of our freedoms uh, we've had taken away from us uh, so that we could be protected, so that we could have more safety, so that we could sleep better at night. We have lost many of our freedoms. I believe that the prophetic clock struck a different hour and a different age when those trade center buildings came crashing down. And we here in the United States, in Washington, D.C., in New York City, lost over 3,000 fellow Americans. The world changed. And, uh, and we're going to see that as we continue to read. And so this man, president of Iran, said, my mission then is to prepare the way of the end times. And I'm going to enlarge upon that. He mentioned that it's his job to prepare for the arrival of the prophet Imam Mahdi. And you, think, you folks may want to take some notes and write this down. That is spelled M-A-H-D-I, Mahdi. The Quran, you all know, was written by Muhammad, Muhammad, the originator of the faith of Islam, lived between 570 and 632. The Sunni Muslims believe that the Quran is indeed the Word of God, and to the larger degree, the Shiite Muslims agree with them in that area. Now, I'm going to share with you briefly a little bit of end-time Islamic prophecy. It comes in three major phases and has involved in it three major players. Number one, Dajjal. Dajjal in the Islamic faith is the name for the Antichrist, or perhaps better in their understanding, the anti-Muhammad. Dajjal, they believe, is likely to be a Jew. He's going to come in the last days. He's going to do miracles. He's going to perform signs and wonders. He's going to heal the sick. He's going to raise the dead. And he's going to claim, finally, to be Allah. Now let me talk to you again about Mahdi. Centuries back, the prophets of Islam were being hunted down and murdered. One by one by one, hunted down and murdered. There was a boy, not yet a teenager, who was next in line to be one such prophet. His name was Mahdi. He was five years of age when they came looking for him. His parents and others secreted him down inside a well. Now, this I remind you again, ladies and gentlemen, has been hundreds and hundreds of years in the past. 941. The teaching in Islam is that Mahdi is to return in the last days. He's to reign here upon the earth. He is to return only after the death of a great and famous Muslim leader, and when he returns, all the Jews will be killed, and all of the others in the world, including the folks in the United States, are going to become converts to Islam. I'm going to read you a little reference from a book written by a man with a great background in the Middle East. His name is Saeed Ayuba. His book, entitled The Antichrist, refers to all that I have just shared with you in the above. He says that it is the belief of the present president of Iran that he is the one appointed by Allah and inspired by Muhammad to bring on the chaos that is necessary before, before Mahdi returns. It's his job to hasten the end time and to bring on, he says, as Christians might call it, the great tribulation. That is his mission. That is his objective. That, he says, is his job. From Fox News, night before last, 
this little bit of information that you probably are aware of. Fox News said two nights ago that Iran now has a nuclear weapon mounted atop a warhead of medium range, a warhead with an ability to strike any place in Israel. Iran for a long while has been struggling to become a world superpower, a nuclear power, and many believe they're already there, and some others believe they're months or perhaps at best two or three years away from that. Now I'm going to share with you again a quotation. This one is from a fellow by the name of Osama bin Laden. Does that ring any bells in your head? Here's what he recently said. It came out of tape and we know that it's his voice. He said, acquiring nuclear weapons is a religious duty. We have finally acquired these weapons. Therefore then, I thank Allah for these weapons. Nuclear jihad, a nuclear weapon that would bring an end to civilization, a civilization that does not believe, like, or agree with this faith of Islam. Now, I'm going to quote once more this from the present president out in Iran. And he said this, you ask, is it possible to see a world without the United States of America and without the Jews? Yes, he said. Israel must be wiped from the face of the map. Have you heard about the recent increase in the price of gasoline? Yeah, that's not news to us, is it? The pain is becoming almost unbearable for we of the middle class and the lower folks who have to drive to work every single day. Well, there is a man who set about to try to do something about it. He's a Vietnamese vet. He's um, the founder of Federal Express. His name is Frederick Smith. And I want to read you just one statement that he shared with Newsweek magazine in just the last week. It should not be forgotten that the proximate climate of World War II was when the United States placed an oil embargo against Japan. We were then an oil exporting nation. World War II was largely won over in Europe by the United States control of the supply of fuel to Germany. And then he goes on to make the case that most of our oil comes from the Middle East, from largely Iran. Now, very briefly only, I want to talk to you about the connection with Russia. It won't come as a surprise, surprise to you folks to know that the warmness and the friendship that we thought we had with the former Soviet bloc is cooling off. And some say to a frightening degree. The present president of R Russia has taken giant steps backward from where the nation was 10 years ago. In an article from the U.S. News and World Report magazine, from an editorial, by the way, Mort Zuckerman, article entitled Moscow's Soul Man, he said, of greatest concern is Russia's president's attitude toward Iran. He's resumed arms sales to them. He's providing support for the billion-dollar nuclear plant. He's continuing to oppose any sanctions that the rest of the world would try to enforce upon Iran. He's helping them greatly in their march toward nuclear enrichment and to sell Tehran high-quality arms, including ground-to-air missiles. Interesting. Interesting. The origin of the problem of the Middle East, you folks are well aware, began in the home of Abraham hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Abraham and his wife Sarah had so long for a little baby boy, waited and watched and watched and waited and no son came. And then one night God spoke to him in terms of covenant or contract or promise. He said, Abraham, if you'll continue to witness for me in this way that you've been doing, I one day will bless you with a baby boy, and through that baby boy, I will bless the entirety of the rest of the world. And from that point on, Abraham watched and waited with eager anticipation for a pregnancy between himself and his wife, Sarah. Years passed, and there was no baby. And then Sarah passed the age of childbearing. And one evening, Abraham comes to the front door of the tent, 
and he's met there by Sarah, and she sees his long face and knows surely his hurting heart, and so she makes to him a suggestion. She says, Abraham, dear, it's fine with me if you take our housekeeper, Hagar, you marry her, and perhaps to you and Hagar a little child will be born, and, and God will fulfill his promise. And so Abraham took the advice of his Sarah, his wife Sarah, rather, and he, he called in the housekeeper, Hagar, and asked her to marry him, and she said, all right. And she moved into one of the bedrooms. And there long to this relationship, there was born a little baby boy whom they named Ishmael. Ishmael was not the child of promise. He was a child of human devising. He was a child of, wor of works. Years and years go by, and then wonder of wonders, there is another pregnancy, this time between Abraham and Sarah. And by the way, ladies, Sarah is now 90 years of age. Imagine that. <gasps> 90 years old and a baby's guy. We've got to get a nursery <laughs> together. And Abraham is beyond 100. And when the baby boy was born, when the baby was born, they named him Isaac. Isaac was a child of promise. Isaac was a child of faith and not human devisings. But here now is a problem. We have two ladies. They're both married to the same man. Each of them has a little boy that she believes is the child of promise. We have all the elements of an explosion, and one day it happens. Abraham again comes to the front door of the tent, and again he's met by his first wife, Sarah. Her attitude is very different now. She says, listen, dear, I've had it up to here. You tell her to get out of my house, out of my kitchen, out of my bedroom, and tell her to take that brat of hers with her. Exactly. And again, Abraham does as Sarah says. He goes to his second wife, Hagar, and his first son, Ishmael. He puts money in their hand and sends them from his home, and they leave with bitterness and resentment that continues till this very day. For from Abraham through Hagar and Ishmael have come all of the Palestinians, all of their Arabic neighbors, and from Abraham through Isaac and Sarah that Sarah and Isaac have come, the people we now call the Jews or Israel. They're first cousins. They ought to be the best friends. It's family, but it's a family feud, not unlike the McCoys and their family, huh? Not unlike it at all, except now it has turned nuclear. The Arabs are related in curious ways to the Iraqis and the Iranians. The large degree of their relationship happens to be with their faith and with their language as well. They're united in their religion. They are united to a large degree in their faith. We think about the problems over in Iran and Iraq, and then we think, well, we have a lot of friends in the area. You know, we, ha we have over in the United Arab Emirates some friends, and... and um, and in Saudi Arabia, we have friends, and yet our seeming friends over there are doing nothing. They're saying really nothing at all about the Islamic extreme, extremists who are destroying our people and knocking down our buildings. They say nothing, and those who are on the inside say there is little doubt, but that they are financing the terrorism throughout the world. They're behind it with their petrodollars. Curious day that we've come to. Now, in the mind of the extremists in Iran and Iraq and over in Lebanon and elsewhere, Syria, Israel must be, must be wiped off the map. Not just, uh, not just silence, not just harm to some degree, but totally and completely wiped off the map. I'm going to again read you now from a news magazine. Here it is. Here's the headline. Muslim leaders warn the Pope that the survival of the world is at stake. Muslim leaders, extremists in Islam. And I'll give you just a sentence or two. The survival of the world is at stake. If Muslims and Christians do not quickly make peace with one another, leaders of the Muslim world warn the Pope and, and all of his Christian friends today. And then it goes on to say that this phrasing echoes the New Testament passage that he who is not with me is against me, warning the world, warning the church, speaking to the world and the church through the Pope. Now I want to just transition again a bit and share with you something that I refer to as the Hitler connection. 
The name Iran is a fairly new name. The nation is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, as we've said a bit ago. We believe in that part of the world. Civilization was born. But the name Iran is a new name. Until 1939, I'm sorry, 1935. Until 1935, the name was Persia. And that's the way it's referred to again and again and again in the Bible. It was changed in 1935 by the Shah of Iran, Shah uh, Pahlavi. The name Iran is related directly and exactly to the word Aryan. Iran, Aryan. Now there are three understandings of that word and there are two spellings of the same word. The first and primary understanding to the folks out in that part of the world would relate to their language, Aryan, the language, that which is common to Indo-Iran, Indo-Iraq, Aryan language. The second meaning, a little bit different and a little bit of a different spelling, relates back to a man by the name of Arius who lived in the fourth century and promoted throughout Christianity, which was in its infancy, that Jesus Christ was not eternal God, but rather he was a created being, less perhaps even than an angel. And that became known as Arianism as well. So there's the language idea of Arianism, and there is the idea that Jesus Christ is not eternal God, that he may have been sort of a prophet, but um, hardly more than that. And then there's a third meaning and to those of us who live in the Pacific Northwest, this one perhaps is more familiar to us, Arianism. Does that ring any bells from over around uh, Hayden Lake, Idaho, and, and certain places in um, Arkansas, Missouri, the Aryan hangouts, the skinheads? At the bottom line, those Aryans are Jew haters. And there too are determined to get rid of anything that is Jewish. And so I find this interesting connection that I call the Hitler connection. And we've been hearing from the news commentators a great deal lately about Muslim fascism. Fascism, of course, you know, demands a dictatorship and total control of a population. And all of these things are related. Peggy and I were in Phoenix when a few days ago, the Super Bowl took place. Maybe some of you were there. Maybe like me, you couldn't afford to be there. Or more like me, you'd rather go, you'd rather go walking and pick oranges. I've never really cared for spectator sports. If you love football, you'll have to forgive me. I'd like to go fishing with you. All right. <laughs> there was intense security all around the Super Bowl. In fact, all around the city of Phoenix. We, Peg and I, were camped, and I use that in quotation marks, about three miles from where the Super Bowl was played at the great Phoenix University Coliseum. The police presence was everywhere. I mean, they must have brought in the police forces of the whole of the state and the surrounding areas and, and everybody that was able to carry a badge. Must have been deputized. I mean, they were everywhere, and we could see the Goodyear blimp clearly from where our RV was parked. And they said that inside, the security was doubly intense. Not only just those metal detectors that you have to walk to and the taking off your shoes, but all other kinds of security to the point that some folks were frightened, perhaps not with bad reason, for it was discovered a week later that there was a man who was headed for the inside. They caught him just before he got inside, and he was going there to do ex what was called extreme violence, a dirty bomb, not a nuclear explosion that destroys a whole city, but a dirty bomb the size of a refrigerator could destroy the largest portion of New York City, all of Manhattan to be precise. If that should happen, goes the commentator, Wall Street would instantly shut down. 
You know, of course, what that would do to the financial world. We control the financial world. If Wall Street goes down, the economies of the world shut down immediately and automatically, and all of the money in your bank accounts and all of your electronic checking and all of that sort of thing comes to an end, and it'd be very unlikely that you'd even be able to pass a $100 bill if you go to the bank or to the Walmart store. And yes, by the way, I love the super Walmart. <laughs> you may catch me there. Nothing proud about Lyle. Wonderful place. <coughs> Senator Richard Luger, who is the head of the Foreign, Ra Foreign Relations Department of the United States, said, and I'm quoting now, the possibility of a nuclear threat that could end civilization in the United States within 10 years is right now at 70%. That, ladies and gentlemen, gives me cause for pause. Jesus must come again. No oil, no defense. The airplanes can't fly. The tanks can't run. Tehran, Tehran, Iran has 1,500 missiles that are capable to be dropped over in Israel, and they are arming them now as we speak with nuclear warheads. We're not tonight only going to just talk about the problems of extremists over in Islam. We're going to talk about some causes, and I'm going to take your Christian minds back a few hundred centuries to the Crusades. Does that ring any bells in your minds? All right. The folks who are causing the problems out there are saying that one of the reasons we are soaring, one of the reasons we're finally striking out is because you Christians destroyed so many hundreds and hundreds, yes, and thousands of the early believers of Islam. The Christian Crusades. And it's time, they say, for revenge. Military bases. Military bases built by the United States in Iraq are right on the border with Iran. Those who are running for a public office at the highest level are saying, you put me in and I'll bring an end to the war. I'll have the troops home within just a few weeks or months at most and the war will be over. Ladies and gentlemen, the war will not be over. We're building one of the largest military bases the world knows right on the Iran-Iraq border, and I've got news for you, ladies and gentlemen. We are there to stay. We're not putting in temporary installations. These are not mobile homes that someone is setting up somewhere. We are there to stay. And we're not about to come home in the, at the early moment or in the near future. We are there to stay. I want you to open your Bibles with me, please, if you will to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 finds our Lord Jesus answering a question of his disciples. They've said to him, Lord, tell us, tell us about the end of the world and what it's going to be like just before you come back. Jesus sets his disciples down on the Mount of Olives. They sit with their backs to the uphill side, and when you do that, you're looking right at the temple square. And the disciples have said, Lord, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it wonderful? And Jesus said, yes, it is. But one day, the temple is going to be knocked down till not one stone is left on another. By the way, we're going to talk about that on another evening. And the disciples said, Lord, tell us more about that. And so Jesus did. He said, the Jews are going to fall by the edge of the sword. They're going to be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be walked upon by Gentiles until the time of Gentiles is over. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in June of 1967, when the Jews went inside the city of Jerusalem and took back east side, west side, the Wailing Wall, and the whole place, this passage, from my mind at least, took on a brand new meaning. Jesus from the Holy Land is waving all the red flags, and he's saying, uh, get ready, I'm coming back. I'm soon to be back. You better get ready. It was on deck of the battleship Missouri that General... MacArthur signed with the Japanese the treaty that brought an end to World War II. And after it was signed, he made a very brief speech, one sentence of which said this, We've had our last chance, and Armageddon is at our door. Someone says, well, Lyle, you're, you're kind of a pessimist. It seems like you're just kind of a doomsayer. 
Well, I may be, my dears, a little bit pessimistic about tomorrow, but say I'm the greatest optimist you've ever found about the day after when Jesus comes. I've been asked again and again lately, Lyle, aren't you afraid to read and study the book of Revelation? And I say to them, no, I'm not afraid. Quite the reverse from that. It thrills me. I've read the last page. I know how the story ends. Jesus is coming again. Better things are in store. I read not long ago about a dear little Christian lady who'd made her last will and testament and advised her children of her last wishes and parceled out her favorite things to them. And then she called in her pastor and she said to him, Pastor, I want my funeral to be a little different. She said, I've gone to so many funerals of so many friends and I see them with their hands folded over their chests. I want not to be like that, Pastor. I want in my left hand to be holding my Bible and in my right hand, I want to be holding a fork. The pastor said, what? I can understand your Bible, but in your right hand, you, you want to hold a fork? Yes, pastor. Yes. She said, you know, I don't want to miss any of the fellowship lunches that we have at church. They're always so good. And at the end of the fellowship lunches that are the best, those that come by to pick up the dishes say to me, hang on to your fork. And then I know something better is coming. I know the dessert is coming. And so I want to hang on to my fork. And I want to say to all of you folks tonight, better days are coming. One day soon, war is going to be ended, forever ended. There shall be war and rumor of war until the end. And then Jesus says, sin shall not arise a second time. Something better is coming. And so this preacher would say to you and all of you, hang on to your fork. We thank you, Lord, for the clarity of your word. This sure word of prophecy, wherein do we do well to take heed like the light that shines in the darkness. The holy men of God spoke the prophecies as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We thank you for your promise given to your best friends in an upper room. I will come again. We need you so. Some of us need you more than we recognize. Others of us recognize the necessity of your coming. We're concerned about our kids and our grandkids and some of our neighbors. And so continue to plead with their hearts and beg them to get ready to meet you. And I pray that every person here tonight will be back and tomorrow night bring with them friends and family members and that the crowd will grow. We must get ready to look in the face of Jesus. He's coming ready or not. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.